Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back uh, for your lunch. And for those of you just joining, Amnesty, welcome along this afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Donoghue. I'm from News Talk Radio. And just from the outset, uh, thank you to Amnesty and to uh, Colin McGorman for inviting me this afternoon to chair this session. Uh, and this session is um, Public Attitudes and Power Dynamics. So we're going to get straight into it. It's going to work for those of you who were here earlier on, pretty much the same way as the sessions did earlier. We have three speakers. They're going to make their presentations to us. Uh, store up your questions, write them down on your pictures beside your slides, and afterwards we'll have plenty of time uh, from questions. And I was a little bit worried when you do this type of thing that there won't be enough questions, but from uh, standing at the back of a couple of things earlier, there are plenty of questions. So we'll have plenty of time uh, for you to talk to all three speakers. Uh, so if I could introduce our speakers this afternoon, uh, first of all, at the end of the table, farthest from me here, is Sarah Castle, the head of qualitative methods at Ipsos Mori. Uh, and Sarah is going to make her presentation first in just a second. Uh, we also have Mary Murphy at the table here. Uh, Mary is going to be our second speaker, and she is uh, a lecturer in Irish politics and society and author as well uh, at the Department Department of Sociology at the National University of Ireland. And then finally, we're going to have Grania Healy. Grania will be our last speaker. Uh, amongst many other things, Grania is the chairwoman of the Marriage Equality Initiative. So as we said, we have plenty of time and we, I am expecting we'll have plenty of questions from the room. So I'll ask Sarah to start her presentation. I hope that applause was for me. I'm excited now. <laughs> Um, thank you. Thanks, thanks for having me today. Um, I'm from Ipsos Mori, which, um, if you don't know, is a, a large research agency um, based in the UK, but we're part of a global group. Um, and uh, what our, our bread and butter really is finding out what the public think about all manner of issues. Um, so what I've got for you today is uh, an awful lot of data about uh, public values and also how those relate to perceptions of human rights and generally public opinions about human rights. Um, the, the snag for you guys is that it's all pretty much UK-based. It's, it's um, very much that perspective. So I don't have a lot of data on the Irish situation. But I think um, some of the studies that we've done in, um, that, that we've done in the UK have, have been um, really useful, and they've been useful to the um, Equalities and Human Rights Commission, they've been useful to government, and some of the methods and approaches might kind of perhaps give some of you some ideas for, for similar work in Ireland or for um, other ways to ask these questions or to w ways to, uh, to perhaps interrogate some data that already exists about, uh, about public values and attitudes. Um, so I've got some, uh, the main thing I've, I'm going to talk about is some work that we did, it was actually in 2008, so a, a few years ago, um, but, but still very relevant, um, which was a big study for the EHRC um, about uh, what, do pub what do the public think of human rights, what do they think of the legislation, and how does that fit? Crucially, how does that fit with their sort of values and their, their sense of the society they want to live in, that, that kind of thing. Um, we've also got some, some other data about uh, generally kind of the, co the context of people's lives, their beliefs about society, the kind of world they want to live in, um, and hopefully we can draw some, some conclusions from that. Um, so, so some good news to start with. Um, people, people like the idea of a law about human rights. So just starting from that very basic point, um, you know, more than six out of ten people think we should have a specific law to protect human rights in the UK. Um, when you come on to whether they know about the law that exists and uh, how they think it should be put into practice, things get a little bit more complicated. But, uh, but I think on that basic premise, it's, it's good to know that there is a mandate for human rights legislation to start with. Um, and when we say... The Human Rights Act, have you heard of it? What does it mean to you? Um, we, we get a lot of good stuff. You know, 65% of people think it's about freedoms, as dignity and respect is important, right to life, right to privacy and liberty. Um, slightly more worrying is uh, the 22% uh, thinking that it's about political correctness. And I think that, that sets up some of the tensions um, that I'm sure you know from your own work and that we, that we see a lot of the time when we talk to the public about these issues, um, how, how are the rights being put into practice, how, how do they actually play out in, in life. Um, so obviously 64% of people thinking human rights are meaningful, they're not meaningless to me, um, but then you know, a good 40% of people say you know, they may have a problem in the UK with human rights, but then a good 80% of people saying that actually some people are taking unfair advantage. So again, we get that split, that kind of, that, that, that schizophrenia, if you like, in, in perceptions of, of what the rights are all about. Um, and the only people who benefit from human rights are those who don't deserve them. 42% um, of people think that. So there's a balance there, a real split in, in the public. Um, 
the bottom one there, you might not get that so much in Ireland. Um, you are less Europhobic than, uh, than, than people, people back home. Um, but I think that's, that's one of the stories behind attitudes to human rights in the UK uh, about sovereignty and about uh, whether it's European legislation um, changing the way that we do things. Uh, so splitting out the people that think it's all about political correctness, maybe not entirely surprising. It goes with a little bit. It goes with being more conservative. Um, so, so I think that kind of starts starts you off thinking maybe you'd segment the public, um, finding out more about how different members of the public see this and why they why they have this kind of cluster of, of views. Coming on to the, the Human Rights Act itself, uh, two in five know something about it, but uh, similar proportion don't know much about it. So, so we're, kind of, we're kind of split. There's still a lot of work to be done on communicating what the act is, what it can be used for. Um, so that's just a little bit of background about how people see the legislation, the idea of human rights. If we take a wider look at what the values are people want to live by and how those values then link to their perceptions of rights. Ooh. And that's completely vanished. Anyway, um, <laughs> obviously nobody thinks anything about these things. Uh, the, the top one, being treated with dignity and respect, a good 65% of people um, think that that's very, very important. And a, and a similar number think being able to express your views freely is an important value for living in Britain today. So I apologise about the lack of uh, numbers. They are in your slide packs. Um, and I think that the, the point of this slide really is to say that uh, it's not totally dissimilar from the human rights agenda. Um, and, and taking another, another slightly broader look, let's look at some other things around the society we want to live in. Um, there's a, a real change now. People are less likely to think a woman's role is to be a wife and mother. Um, and, that's, and those that do think that tend to be older, tend to be lower socioeconomic grades. So uh, there's, there's a kind of shift in the culture about uh, access to opportunities, perhaps. You could read a lot into that. Um, when we talk about ethnicity, um, we ask everybody, you know, w effectively, would you mind if your GP or your teacher or your sister's boyfriend or whatever was um, someone with a disability or was someone from a different ethnic group to you? And you can see those numbers are really low, like n nobody's that bothered um, about the ethnic group of their GP, for example. Um, so that, you know, they say that, although we need to take that with a pinch of salt in terms of how people respond in surveys, what they think they're like and what they may be like in, in real life. Um, and about skin colour as well, I think that that battle, thankfully, has been, has been won, um, that there's very few people now saying that to be British, you have to be white. And again, there's a, that's older groups. Um, and when we say, would you mind living in an area that's got all sorts of different ethnic groups? Are you happier living in a multicultural, diverse area or not? You know, people tend to agree that it's much better to live in an area that's more multicultural. Um, although, interestingly, if you think about... Uh, people aren't, aren't so worried about... Uh, people with disabilities now, but mental illness is, is an interesting taboo. Uh, this was from a survey in Scotland, actually, that uh, people tend to want to be very quiet and, um, and private about uh, having personal experience of mental health problems. So maybe reading between the lines, there's still a little bit of a sort of social taboo around that. Um, and sexual orientation is another very interesting one, and I'm sure this would come up very differently again in Ireland because of the different cultural context as well. Um, but uh, People, people are kind of happier about your GP and your teacher and your boss being from a different ethnic group or having a disability. Uh, they're less happy about people being gay or lesbian. So, you know, it's still, it's still, a, low, it's still a low number, but it's, uh, it's an interesting difference, I think. Um, and I think uh, within a lot of these, these findings, there is a tension about the kind of society that people want to be. Everyone agrees equality is a good thing. Everyone agrees fairness is a good thing. It's kind of motherhood and apple pie. But what does that actually mean in practice? Um, fairness can be different things. Um, if you say, is it about making sure everybody has the same opportunities, regardless of their start in life? OK, half of us think that's, uh, that's what fairness means. Um, that sort of equality of opportunity. Concentrating on providing help for vulnerable people, 27% of people. And then 19% say, well, it's, it's about giving everybody the same services. So there's still that, that, that debate that we know about, is it about equality of outcome? Is it about equality of opportunity? It's still a very live discussion. Um, and what I mostly do is qualitative work. So I get people in rooms, often sort of about the same size as this, and kind of badger them all day with, with difficult questions and get them to debate different things. And these issues and these kind of positions, these mental positions that people hold, come out through the day. So quite often you'll have the same person expressing all these different views at different times during the day. And if you sort of test it on yourselves, you can probably work out, you could probably imagine case studies where 
you'd think one thing and you'd think another and you might express a different view, um, which I think just shows it's, it's such a sort of sensitive, difficult issue. It's hard to get at in, in surveys. Um, this is very interesting, that the kind of society we want to live in is changing. So in the 80s, in the late 80s, you might have thought in the UK that we'd all, ter we'd all be terribly individualistic um, in the sort of late years of the Thatcher government and uh, all of that sort of thing. Uh, but 58% of people thought we need to have a society that emphasises social collective provision of welfare. Um, nowadays, if you have a look, more of us are starting to gradually think that individuals ought to be able to just look after themselves and be encouraged to do that. That could just be a, a linguistic thing. It could just be that the rhetoric of the time, the way that we're talking about welfare and benefits, that sort of thing now, is more about helping people to help themselves. But it does, it does follow from our work and from work of other social commentators as well. Um, and it's really quite an interesting, an interesting kind of switch there. It's quite a pronounced trend. Um, I think it's, it's also, yeah, I'll say that later. <laughs> I don't want to shoot, shoot, shoot my bulk too early. Um, so given that, given that we've got that, given that we've got that trend, um, a lot of people think government's kind of done too much already and, and maybe people should take responsibility. But then you've also got an equal number of people saying, well, you know, we're worried about vulnerable people too. So even though we're changing in that regard about what we want society to be, we still are worried about the vulnerable, which I think is good news for those of us wanting to communicate on human rights or how human rights can help the most vulnerable. That may be a kind of a way in um, to, uh, to talk to people about this. Um, here's another example of a, of a similar trend to the one I illustrated earlier. This is from the British Social Attitudes Survey, where they ask all sorts of questions um, and track them over a, a very long time. Um, we used to think that uh, we need to help the poor with welfare benefits. Now we don't really care, <laughs> I think is the story. Or certainly 43% of people um, are much less bothered and that's, in, and that's increasing. And this has been through, okay, it's been through the sort of boom years in between, but uh, it, it does track across recessions, across different economic times as well. Um, and if you look at the age groups, it gets really interesting because it's not that people perhaps are, I don't know, very idealistic when they're young and then become more set in their ways as they're older um, and, and less, you know, a, a more, more right wing or whatever the theory you might have. Um, it's actually this younger group, that new, that dark grey line at the bottom is the youngest people. Uh, they are the most hard line about to spend on welfare. Um, and although this isn't specifically about human rights, it is a really vital context, I think, for understanding how people think of themselves, how people think of the self versus the other, and what group am I in, and what, what responsibility do I have to other people? And I think that, that kind of climate makes the communication job for those of us talking about rights very different. Um, so we also did a lot of qualitative research in 2008 about how do you build public support for human rights, how do you make the link between the values and the rights. Um, and a lot of it is about language and coming from where people are. So instead of saying, what do you think about human rights, we started our big workshops with saying, let's make a sort of huge map on the wall of everything that you think is important for people to have in a civilised society. And we ended up with kind of broadly three types of thing. One was basic needs, which is that kind of physical well-being, and a lot of stuff about emotional well-being, you know, love and community and that sort of thing, which is very interesting and we weren't expecting that. Um, Public, excuse me, public services uh, were, were part of that sort of sense of basic needs. So you can already see perhaps some areas of rights might fit in with that. You know, physical well-being has a lot of uh, human rights implications there. Um, there was a lot of structural stuff, uh, law and order, and these, these fitted very well with kind of ideas of conditional responsibilities and conditional rights about, you know, playing by the rules and uh, making sure that you, you do the same as everybody else. Um, and this is where people started talking about common sense as well. And they didn't want there to be laws here, which made it easy for people to kind of get things that were not fair. Um, and then there's a whole set of values about fairness again, natural justice, being, being respected and tolerated and treating other people. So even in 2008, there was, there was a, lot of, um, a lot of useful stuff coming out from people about uh, treating everybody the same, uh, making sure that everyone is respected. And, uh, and I think that's a, that, that gave me the sense that that comes from the kind of the framework of all the, all the human rights work that has been done, that, that, that the positive side of, of political correctness, I think, has filtered through to people even though they don't really realise it. They think it's just being fair, but actually they're thinking about fairness in ways that people weren't thinking perhaps 20 years ago. 
Um, and the underlying values, th th this is kind of what, what they think human rights are, but the, the language and the wording is different. And I won't go through all of this right now, uh, but it's in our report, and you can have a look at the slides afterwards and think about the differences between some of the rights language and some of this language and see, see whether it gives you any, any ideas. Um, but yeah, the, the, these are the kind of words that people, that people used when they were describing the values that they thought were important in society. Um, so, all of this stuff kind of plays very nicely into human rights. And when we were speaking with people in, the, in, in groups, um, it was very easy for us to say, when you say, you know, equality, do you mean X, Y, Z? And with these rights, you know, showing them a list of human rights, saying, would, would those rights fit into what you've just said? People say, yeah, definitely, you know, can't argue with that. It makes, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but then the other thing that we did was uh, give people case studies of slightly difficult and marginal um, complicated cases. Uh, so there were some that were about, you know, um, uh, domestic violence. There were some that were about uh, a young protester who had his mobile phone um, under surveillance because the police thought he might commit a crime, but he hadn't done. And all these, all these kind of difficult, difficult questions where you could debate about uh, whether it's somebody's right being infringed or whether um, the human rights legislation perhaps is protecting someone who might be committing a crime. All, all these discussions came up. Um, and, and this was where people started to get really uncomfortable and worried. And this was where the basic human rights, like you know, right to life, that kind of thing, seemed to be forgotten. And people focused their attention on very, very conditional rights. And, and they mixed up sort of socioeconomic rights with human rights. And I think that's something that happens a great deal, um, both in the projects that I've done here and also other projects that I do for, for policy and for, for government generally. People are always muddling up what people have a right to, to what they sort of ought to do to make society run fairly. It's, it's not, it's not a, a clear distinction. Um, I wonder whether perhaps those of us that work more closely within human rights have a clearer sense of the boundary between what a human right is and what is a sort of socioeconomic decision that you take to, to run your society. And, and perhaps for the public, it's not quite as, as clear cut. Um, so, we, uh, when, we, when we did this, this research, we then um, looked at a model of how to engage people with difficult issues. And this is a model that we've used um, for engaging the public with um, poverty in the UK. So that was some work I did a, a little while back, uh, trying to deal with the issue that people didn't really think poverty was an issue for people in the UK. I think that may have changed more recently because, uh, because of the... the cuts and that sort of thing um, but uh, we, we kind of have an advocacy model that works quite well that you know you're not going to uh, you're not going to be engaged and give a mandate for supporting something unless you're aware of it and then unless you trust it and then whether you have some involvement or action um, and, and I think that transactional stage is really important because it's all about feeling that you can do something about it um, people are very unlikely to give their support for something if they feel that it kind of doesn't matter whether they give the support or not, or they don't know how that support will be used or mobilised. Um, and I think that's really crucial in the area of human rights. Um, and then there's all sorts of other things about rewards and benefits and people becoming activist in, in, in the service of a cause. Um, so we, we kind of identified that there's a bit of a, a barrier there, really, uh, with awareness and trust in terms of human rights. So everyone says they're important, but sort of in summary, really, they don't really know what they are <laughs> and they don't know how they, how they relate to other sorts of rights. A lot of people don't think that human rights are important in the UK compared to the very serious rights violations that they see on a global scale. Um, they don't use the language of rights. They use the language of what's right and what's fair. Um, and there's this real confusion, as I was saying, perhaps between moral rights, legal rights, um, you know, common sense things that you have a right to expect, all that kind of thing. And, and then also a sort of communications point that perhaps, perhaps some of you have, have met with in your, in your work is that people find the stories about human rights abuses very depressing and it makes them feel very powerless. So a kind of natural human reaction is to kind of go away from that and not think about it and not, not worry about it. Um, and this is the case, I, I've done some other work with frontline um, public service workers more recently for the EHRC, and we talked to policemen and we talked to, um, uh, who did we talk to, care home workers, those kind of people. Um, and even for them, the idea that there might be human rights abuses going on, even though they, you could argue that they have a really key frontline role in being able to do something about it and identify things and sort it out, even they felt quite powerless and quite vulnerable and quite worried about 
what these human rights abuses might be and how they could get involved with sorting them out. So there's a real sort of sense of kind of nervousness at getting involved, I think. Um, and then, you know, the, uh, and this might be related to the idea of trust, that there are pretty sensational and negative media stories, mostly in the UK, about people taking advantage of rights um, and a general growth of the compensation culture uh, where people, you know, uh, take advantage of, um, of, of all sorts of things to get things that they, that they shouldn't have according to natural justice. Um, I told my mother-in-law last night that I was coming here today and she said, oh, human rights. And then she, she thought for a minute and the first thing she said was, tell them that prisoners shouldn't have the vote. And, and uh, my mother in law is slightly to the right of Genghis Khan on most things, but, um, but I thought that was just, even just, you know, as a tiny little anecdote, that, that that links totally to that in her mind. She doesn't think of all the great things that human rights have done for society and, and the positive benefits. Um, and people are not sure who's responsible for enforcing human rights. Even people who work on the front line in public services don't know if it's really their job or not. So there's a big, a big issue there, I think. And I don't know if that would be the same in, in this country or, or, or whether that would be different. Um, so in, in summary, I think I'm, I'm out of time now. Um, a lot of it is about messaging, I think. It's that sort of how do human rights help ordinary people? Who's responsible for enforcing them? And how do they do that in a way that allows them to use their judgment and do things that are sensible and not kind of be then unfair to other groups if you're trying to be unfair to one group? Um, and also, how do you use human rights yourself? Uh, a lot of the time, people would be sitting in a discussion saying, well, this is very interesting, learning about how perhaps other sorts of people in society can benefit from human rights. But how do I benefit? And, and that's perhaps not as selfish as it might sound, but perhaps people are not making the link to we, we, we all could live in a society where we benefit from having a climate where human rights are respected. And somebody needs to kind of draw out that story, really, of how do we benefit from that? Is it economically? Is it socially? You know, what's, what are the things that we all feel better about because we live in a world where human rights are, 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 are better understood and better enforced? Um, so that's kind of where I'm, I'm finishing for today. I hope that's given you a bit of background on some of the work that, that we've done on public attitudes. Um, and uh, that's me. Oh, very, very finally, actually. Um, people get most of their information from telly still. So uh, you take, take, take that how you want. I think that just, just shows whatever we do, there's going to be a lot of other cultural things making a difference. So thank you very much.